Welcome to CCG China and the World Dialogue Series, China and the World in Era of Crisis and Renew, a conversation with Financial Times Chief Economics Commentator, Mr. Walt Martin Wolf. This program is presented by the Center for China and Globalization. Pleased to present the presider of this dialogue, CCG President, Dr. Wang Huiyao. Dr. Wang, please. Thank you, thank you, Anne. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, and uh, uh, also uh, to our all uh, audience uh, in China and in other parts of the world. So this is really a great opportunity to uh, uh, have this uh, uh, dialogue with uh, uh, a global opinion leader, uh, Martin uh, Wolf, actually. So, so this is a CCG uh, dialogue, China and the world uh, in the area of crisis and renewal. And uh, this is actually a series of dialogue we had lately. We had uh, actually already talked with uh, Gary Brown. We have uh, talked with Graham Allison, uh, Thomas Friedman, Joseph Nye, Anthony Satch. And this actually is the sixth episode of uh, uh, a dialogue. We're very honored to have uh, uh, Martin Wolf with us today. Uh, my name is uh, Henry uh, Wang Hui Yao, of course, uh, the, the founder and uh, president for, Center for China and the Globalization. Uh, Martin Wolf is a well-known global opinion leader, uh, one of the world's most influential financial writer, as we all know that. Uh, he's the uh, social editor and chief economic commentator, commentator at the Financial Times, and also he was awarded the command of the British Empire in 2020 for service for financial journalism. He's a, a graduate of Oxford University and an honorary fellow of Newfield College of Oxford University. And also he was awarded an honorary degree of Doctor of Letters by the University of Nottingham, and also was made Doctor of Science Economics of University of London by the London School of Economics. So uh, Mr. Wolf is well, well known and well established uh, uh, in the financial, economic, and uh, world affairs at large. Uh, he was also a senior eco economist, actually. He had a very impressive uh, uh, professional life. Uh, a senior economist with the World Bank between 1971 and 1981 for a decade. And uh, he joined the Financial Times in 80, 1987, where he has been the uh, associate editor since 1990 and chief economic commentator since 1996. So we all read. Uh, uh, Martins uh, call them uh, uh, regularly. I mean, you, you are really uh, very <laughs> influential in, the, in terms of the financial and economics uh, arena in, around the world. Uh, so Wolf has been named uh, in the top 100 list of the global think thinkers by the Prospect and by Foreign Policy Magazine. He's the author of a highly regarded books, including Why Globalization Works, uh, this is the book that I'm having today, uh, Why Globalization Works. I bought this book actually at the uh, UN uh, head office in New York, uh, uh, actually uh, a few years back, but uh, you know, it's still well selling. And uh, he has another book, uh, Fixed Global Financing. And his most recent book is on the global financial crisis, the shifts and the shocks. What we have learned and have and still to learn from the financial crisis. So all his books actually has been translated by the China City uh, Press. Uh, and, and this, this uh, dialogue is actually in partnership with China City Press as well. And uh, uh, so that we are very um, glad to have uh, Dr. Uh, you know, uh, Wolf with us. He's a stalwart participant in the annual China Development Forum, which I met uh, 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 Martin quite a few times, and also imagine in Singapore and uh, elsewhere in the world, you are, you are a frequent speaker <laughs> throughout the world. So uh, good morning, Martin, and uh, great to have you. And maybe you can say a few words uh, to our uh, uh, audience here and, and, uh, and uh, other parts of the world. So first of all, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much for having invited me. It's also an honor. Um, I, I'm always amused when people introduce me as a commander of the British Empire, which just shows, as I like to say, that whatever the British have lost in the last century, they haven't lost their sense of humor, uh, since obviously 
the British Empire disappeared very, very long time ago, which was a good thing, in my view. Uh, the um, I'm very pleased to have this dialogue on a crucial subject at a crucial time. Uh, we are going through extraordinary transformations in the world order um, uh, because of economic developments, uh, because of political developments, and of course, because of the pandemic. So we are all being forced to rethink uh, our view of the world, how it's going to evolve. And I've come to the view, I'm just completing a book on the future of the West, um, but I have come to the view that this decade is looking increasingly what I refer to as, as a hinge of history, one of those decisive moments in human affairs, which will determine the future of our world for a long time. Will it be prosperous and peaceful? Uh, uh, will we manage our big challenges above all climate? Uh, will we manage to cooperate satisfactorily uh, and or will we uh, will the order we have created in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, the, the order of global cooperation for all its failures of globalization, uh, will it collapse? And I think those issues are very much live and the next 10 years or so is likely to provide us with answers. And I have to say, I myself uh, am very concerned about the developments we see. I've been around, as has been noted, for a long time. And I think this is possibly the most challenging period of my lifetime. I was born, I should say, immediately after the Second World War, so I didn't experience that catastrophe. But I've been alive now for 75 years, or very nearly. And this is a very challenging period we're now entering. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Martin. And uh, absolutely, you, you you've been around for for quite some time, and uh, you 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 witness all these uh, great uh, challenges. But but as you said, I, I agree with you. You know, it's probably the current uh, contemporary uh, challenge we are facing is unprecedented uh, in 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 this hundred years, probably. Uh, and and also, of course, we are, with this pandemic uh, swept uh, all over the world, and also with the uh, economic. Uh, that uh, slowing down uh, around the world. We, we are we're actually seeing a, a, a transformation going on uh, of the global economy and a global economy is struggling to, to catch up. So, so 2021 is projected probably to, to be the year of, of recovery. So maybe you could give a bit of uh, uh, the outlook. I mean, for this financial, for this, uh, you know, since the financial crisis, we're having this, uh, uh, pandemic crisis uh, 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 again. Uh, you you are a great uh, uh, expert on, on crisis. I mean, you, know, you wrote uh, uh, two books on, on those financial crises now. So I, I'm glad you are having a new book comes out. But what about this? Uh, uh, you know, currently this pandemic uh, uh, crisis. I think it's going to reshape the uh, the global uh, uh, economy and also the political landscape and uh, and also change the way we, the global governance is uh, is. Uh, uh, is uh, reconducted. So perhaps you, you can share some light on that first. Well, there's so much to say. Um, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, uh, so the first point is the one you noted. Um, we've now had two very significant global crises in less than 15 years. So the last one was the, the Western financial crisis. Um, which I think of as 2007 to nine, but it went on in Europe to 2015. So it was a long crisis. And then um, just a few years later, we were hit by the pandemic. And uh, uh, um, while that was an event that many had pred predicted that such a thing could happen, um, indeed, it's not at all surprising. Humanity has had a long history of experiencing pandemics. Nevertheless, we didn't know when it happened, and then it happened. And that's been another huge shock. And in a way, um, so far as I can see, it's the most global economic crisis there has ever been, in the sense that it affected more countries in the world, basically pretty well every country in the world, more profoundly um, uh, than any other comparable event 
at least in modern times. And when I think of modern times, I mean really since the Industrial Revolution, so about the last two centuries or so. Of course, there have been immense, much more damaging pandemics in the past. We think of the Black Death in the uh, 14th century, but that was so long ago that obviously the, the the memories have largely gone, except in the history books. Now, if we think of the pandemic, so it was global, it was sudden, and it led to a very, very sharp contraction last year, particularly in the first half of last year, across a very large range of economies, and particularly in the in the West, but also a bit earlier in China. Now, um, what can we say uh, about this in terms of its social and economic effects? I, I think I, we can say the following things. The first, which in a way uh, is the most interesting and important, is how big the economic damage was of an event that at least as a pandemic, in terms of its fatalities, uh, was historically relatively minor. Um, so I look at, I've been looking at the famous Spanish, what we call the Spanish flu of 1918, so just over 100 years ago. Now, nobody knows exactly how many people died then, but the estimates are probably about 50 million. The central estimate is about 50 million, which, given the population growth, will be equivalent to 200 million now. And so far, uh, this pandemic has killed, thank God, uh, fewer than three million. So it's a much smaller pandemic in its health effects, but its economic effects have been much bigger. As far as we know, of course, we didn't measure economies in the way we did before, uh, uh, but we do now, 100 years ago, but it's certainly much bigger. Why is that? This is the most important point. The, interest, the important point is our societies, and I think this is a very good thing, have an enormous uh, value on human life. And we are prepared to pay enormous economic prices in order to protect human lives. And that was clear in China when you closed down Wuhan, for example, in order to contain the virus whatever it costs. And the same was true all across the Western world. We lot, we basically closed down our economies. People stayed at home. So uh, even in uh, relatively poor countries, there were lockdowns. So that's, we really care about human life. That's the first really big lesson. And I think that's fantastic. And the, the, the second thing we learned is we have the means to, to do something about it because our technology has advanced so much. So that we have learned, as we're now experiencing with this Zoom call, we have learned that with modern technology, and we couldn't have done this even 10 years ago, that we can run much of our modern economy without physically meeting. Uh, now, that generates huge inequality in our societies because the people who can do it this way tend to be the more prosperous, uh, the people uh, uh, with graduate degrees, these are the sort of people who can work at a distance. By and large, the great exception, of course, is the medical profession, obviously. By and large, people with degrees have been pretty safe. People who have to work face-to-face -to -face with other people have not. And that has created huge social divisions uh, as a result of the pandemic. And also great divergence among countries because some countries have much, having more advanced economies, are able to do much more online than others. So that's the inequality point we've learned. That very, very important. The third thing we've learned is the immense advances in medical science. And our ability, which nobody really believed a year ago, to create uh, uh, billions of vaccines which work, very clearly work, and produce them uh, quite a multiple and distribute them very unevenly and very unequally across the world is also an extraordinary lesson. Now, what does this mean? And this is my last point for the immediate future. The countries that have either controlled the uh, disease successfully by other means, notably China, but also uh, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, um, 
are have reopened pretty well. China's economy is growing, of course, very strongly. And of course, the countries that have managed mass vaccination programs, like the US and now the UK, and over the next few months, Europe, uh, will also expand very rapidly. So I expect a big global recovery this year and next, led by the big economies, basically the big Western economies, uh, the, the advanced Asian economies in China. Uh, and that is, after all, most of the world economy. I mean, that's taken together, that's about 75, 80% of the world economy, roughly. Um Unfortunately, there are lots of other countries which are in much worse situation. They don't have the vaccines yet. They're very dependent on tourists who are still not going to travel. <coughs> they have some very big problems. Look at India, look at Africa. And then there's the, the very final thing, the, the remnant of the crisis, which is a huge amount of debt, uh, a lot of it dollar debt. Now, that's going to be perfectly manageable, in my view, in the developed countries, but it will be much more problematic in the emerging countries. So we emerge now strongly, but very unequally. And perhaps it's a very kind of thought. Of course, the crisis has generated a lot of ill will, political in, uh, instability, anger, and that has certainly emerged and will affect the shape of relations in future. Yeah. Uh, thank, thanks, Martin. I think for your for a very uh, uh, timely board uh, analysis of this uh, uh, global pandemic situation, and uh, I think you're you're right. <laughs> we'll see the uh, the recovery, but but it won't be a, a linear, uh, 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 you know, smooth one. It could be zigzag and uh, ups and downs. Uh, we're still seeing uh, things happening in India, and uh, and we 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 don't know what's next. Uh, maybe Africa, or, or there could be. Uh, more uh, uh, second or third wave of that, and uh, and also the 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 the, the uh, Chinese president Xi has actually last year pledged two billion uh, to to the uh, developed countries, developing countries, and WHO to fight. I'm glad to see uh, President Biden pledged two billion also at the uh, G7 summit, and also uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, recently, the, the President Biden announced that he's, uh, you know, he's uh, giving up his patent for the pharmaceutical company uh, on, the, on the vaccine. So, what, what do you think about that? You know, how we can how we can quickly turn this around, and what are the measures we can take on that? Well, um, I'm an agnostic on the value of giving up the patents uh, in this context. In the context of this crisis, um, the uh, I've been persuaded from the work I've done, but I must stress I'm an economist, not a, uh, a chemist uh, or a biological scientist, uh, that um, you know, in the case of pharmaceuticals of this kind, having a patent doesn't really tell you how to make the thing. I mean, these are very complicated things to make. And this is particularly true of the new and very exciting mRNA uh, vaccines, which have been developed in, uh, in Germany and in America. Uh, so just having the patents won't, you, that, you know, you can have it, but it won't mean that suddenly people can produce billions and billions of doses. However, uh, so I think that's a very interesting issue. It's a very emotive issue, but I don't think it affects the next six to eight months or a year, possibly even longer. Um, and so I think I will put that to one side, though it's a very interesting issue. It's quite clear that we have to ramp up production worldwide to something like 10 or 12 billion doses a year. And it is very likely that we will have to multiply vaccinate people. That is to say, because this disease, it is now clear, mutates very quickly. There are many variants now. Uh, so far, the vaccine seemed to work, but nobody knows how long that will be the case. So it's likely we will have to give booster shots, shots to the world. Everybody as it were. Now that creates two problems. We have to ramp up production. It is happening. And we will get to that sort of production level probably by the end of the beginning of next year, but it'll take at least a year or so before we do. And then the crucial question is, can we actually organize the distribution and actual vaccination of pretty well everybody in the world? 
because that's how we want to control this. You know, friends of mine have pointed out, no one's going to be really safe until the disease is completely under control. Otherwise, the mutations will come back to China, to, to, to Britain, wherever. So uh, we have a big challenge ahead of us in terms of production and distribution of vaccine and lots of vaccine-hesitant people. Um, but the progress we made in this regard is, to my mind, also quite unbelievable. You know, the Chinese vaccines, Russian vaccines, Western vaccines, we have the capacity, without a doubt, if we want, to vaccinate the world. And the crucial thing is that the major countries, which have the capacity to, to cooperate to make sure that it actually happens. Absolutely, I agree. We have to collaborate. We have to really work together. Uh, if we're going to, you know, vaccine the world and uh, uh, you know reach poor countries together, I think the the, the, the uh, those countries who already had advanced technology on, on vaccine, uh, absolutely, we we need to work even harder and a more coordinated approach to uh, to do that. Uh, so, so Martin, you are you are a glue on, on globalization. I mean, you published uh, why globalization works in uh, 2004. That is already 16 years ago. And uh, uh, one of the things I think for the last hundred years, what has really uh, unprecedented is the globalization uh, uh, trend and, and the practice and development. And that has really generated an enormous prosperity for our time, but also has now brought us the uh, uh, unprecedented challenge as well as we uh, uh, set out at the beginning. So, so now with, the, with this complication of, uh, of uh, vaccine uh, and also this uh, pandemic, uh, 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 also going on in the world and uh, a vaccine shortage. Uh, also, that countries now seem to get more uh, hijacked by populism and nationalism. And, uh, you know, anyway, uh, probably in the world now, it's, it's a trendy uh, uh, thing to, to, to be, to do that. Uh, countries start, you know, we already have a closed uh, 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 borders basically for the travel. And, but, but also economy-wise, uh, that is also happening. And also there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, downgrade of, of, of each other, and then maybe uh, 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 you know going on across the world and, and all kind of geopolitical things. So, so what do you see is the future of the, of the globalization? Uh, 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 can we continue the, the globalization, or how we can really uh, make a good, good uh, 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 adjustment of that, and also maybe have more inclusive globalization, uh, as you've been often writing that on, on your column. So um, another very big question. So it'll take a, a few minutes to answer as, uh, uh, as the last one. When I analyzed globalization in the book that you referred to, which was published uh, also in China, as you rightly say, uh, um, I think it was published in 2004. So it's nearly 20 years ago. And it was a defense of globalization. At that time, there were a lot of critics in the West uh, you might remember the WTO ministerial meeting in Seattle. It was a very famous event. I think in either 99 or 2000, you could correct me. Uh, yeah. And so it was a defense of globalization. It was basically arguing these people were saying globalization is very bad for developing countries. It's exploitative and we should stop it. It wasn't about the developed countries so much. And I said, well, actually, the evidence is very clear. It's very good for developing countries. And China, of course, was a foremost example. Uh, 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 China's incredible growth, then about 20 years, a little over 20 years, uh, and subsequent growth clearly couldn't have happened without what uh, you refer to in China as reform and opening up. Um, now, when I wrote this book, I said there are two drivers, crudely. There's technology and there's policy. They do interact a bit, in the long run, technology is influenced by policy. But in the medium run, uh, and I mean the long run, centuries, um, or at least many decades, it's technology and policy. So let's look at where we are on technology and where we are on policy. Technology is the underlying potential given technological realities. And policy is, well, all the things you talk about, what governments do. Um, on technology... Um, I think one bit of globalization has been to a substantial extent exhausted. Naturally, it's not a policy thing, and one is just beginning. 
So the bit that is naturally exhausted is the unbundling of supply chains uh, in goods across the world. Um, that's been going on now for quite a long time. We had pretty clear evidence that um, by 10, 12 years ago, after the financial crisis, this is, was slowing. And I think the reason it was slowing was that an enormous part of the opportunities to unbundle physical supply chains had already been exploited. Um, some of the supply chains which had been unbundled with China as part of it were actually moving into China. <coughs> so they were becoming Chinese supply chains. And in addition, the enormous cost advantages uh, that particularly China to a lesser degree Vietnam had in the 80s and 90s were diminishing because wonderful thing, wages were going up. So the result was that a completely natural cessation, not say slowing of the unbundling of physical supply chains occurred. And that won't accelerate until there's some huge new technological improvement. The, 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 our potential through transport links and, and links like the internet, telecommunications links, are not being transformed, with one exception I'll come to in a moment, in this regard. I mean, to give you an example, aeroplanes move basically about as fast now as they did 40 years ago. Uh, we've got huge container ships, but they're probably now about as big as they're ever going to get. Just look what just happened in the Suez Canal. Um, so basically, the 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 the, 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 the container the container of, which is put on the container ships is a great invention, but it's now seventy years old, uh, roughly. So technologically, uh, I think the unbundling of and move of supply chains and the movement of goods may well have reached um, a natural plateau relative to our economy. It might continue a bit, but there's another completely different uh, uh, potential, which is what I think of as virtual globalization or the globalization of, of ideas broadly defined. What we're doing now, uh, what we have discovered in this crisis is that it's actually possible to operate highly interactively really highly interactively um, without being in the same place. And it's obvious to me that that will generate huge potential for interaction among human beings, uh, economic interaction, cultural interaction, interaction in terms of ideas. And here the relevant um, divisions are linguistic more than anything else. And even that with the advances of AI is going to diminish. I'm sure we will soon be in a world in which when we talk like this, not with you, of course, I will talk in English and someone in China will speak in, in Mandarin and I will hear this translated perfectly by AI and the Chinese person will hear it perfectly translated by AI and we'll have a conversation. That may not be this decade, it may be the decade after, but I think this will happen. So I think the virtual globalization has tremendous potential. Uh, and I think it's a wonderfully good thing and it will create great difficulties because, uh, because it will be very difficult to isolate yourself from the world intellectually and culturally. Now, I'm in favor of this, but it will create some challenges pretty obviously. Now, then there's the policy. Now, here it's pretty clear. Uh, we have become more suspicious of one another. Uh, and that's partly because of divergent political developments. I'm not going to talk about China, but I think it's pretty clear. And in the West, clearly our societies have become more divided. That was happening before the financial crisis, but the financial crisis and now the pandemic has made that even bigger. It's made people more suspicious of one another and, and politics more populist and more deeply divided. And when people really don't like one another in a country, this is age old. The one thing they can often agree on is that they dislike foreigners even more. 
So, you know, I'm afraid xenophobia, and this is, we're human, we are all the same. Xenophobia brings people together. <clears throat> and that can be true, I would suggest, even in China and certainly big time in the West. And that's happening. So politicians say, it's nothing to do with what's going on in our country. It's all the fault, let's say, Mr. Trump, it's all the fault of the Chinese. And people will listen to this. And we see this happening, not to the same degree in Europe, but it's happening. And then, of course, uh, so that's the first thing. Then, of course, we are in the midst, objectively, of a massive power shift. And let's be completely realistic about it. The Europeans and their colonial offshoot, the US is a colonial offshoot of Europe, let's be clear, um, a very old one. They've been used to running the world for hundreds of years and they don't like it changing, and they don't know what to do about it. And I think it's also true that China has not any way worked out what it wants to do about its new position. And this is creating tremendous political tension. How do we run the world when we no longer run it, as it were? And that's creating more ill will. And people, then that leads, this combination leads to a desire to protect yourself, to, to make yourself more secure by reducing your alliance on one another, make, by making sure that you remain a world leader in technologies, which is itself, I think, quite understandable. And all that is getting in the way from a policy point of view of globalization. In, and you saw that in the trade war that Mr. Trump launched against uh, China, um, which hasn't gone away, as you know. Um, you can see that in, in friction over international relations, uh, suspicion of each one another, uh, um, which comes out in rhetoric, uh, I think on both sides, particularly, of course, in the US. And that affects globalization because companies then say, quite naturally, okay, we're an American company. You're running an American company. Well, my government looks as though it really doesn't want me to be involved in China. And if I have to choose, well, I, I'm, an, I'm an American company. I've got to do what my government wants. Uh, if I am seen as sort of a bit of a traitor, to my country by providing technology in China and, and using technology in China, I could get in terrible trouble. So these businesses start saying we should go home. And then we have, they all have lots of friction, which is quite normal. There is friction between companies and governments. Then they say, well, maybe it's not worthwhile and the future of globalization is uncertain. I better go home. And that's happening, quite clearly happening. Um, and that happens even if no policy is there. So. The technology is opportunities, I think, have gone in the way I've suggested or going in the way I've suggested. And the policy is reinforcing this. So the globalization of goods and of supply chains is, I think, going to go very significantly into reverse, creating regional supply chains, more obviously. Uh, Chinese-dominated run region, uh, Western run region, how this will work out, very messy. Um, and then we have this overlay of the future of what I call virtual globalization, which is reinforced by the greatest technological development of our era, which is obviously, apart from vaccines, apart from biochemical, bio biology, is artificial intelligence. So it's a very complex, very difficult and uncertain picture. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry it took so long, but it's a yeah, very no, 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 no. So It's a good to, to, to review that, to, to really have a a sober mind to, to, to look at what's happened and, and to reflect that. I, I mean, you, you often has a lot of uh, uh, statistics, charts, and uh, facts. Uh, so so you, you, you've been really uh, catching the trend uh, uh, quite, uh, quite accurate. Well, what, I, what I think now, uh, you know, globalization has been going on for, you know, uh, several decades uh, uh, intensively, probably last hundred years, as you said, when American uh, 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 overtake uh, Europe, uh, UK, and now uh, dominating that for hundred, uh, you know, some years probably. Uh, but but now it seems that the more globalization we're going on, that the the we mo the more we intertwine, and we're not we're not uh, build up trust. Uh, the more we on the, on the currently is on the country, we seems to be more uh, destruct destruct of each other. One of the things, I mean, you're you you very interested in uh, the, the new book that you are coming up, Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, where I think capitalism has been 
been uh, pervaded <laughs> in, in the last uh, you know several hundred years now, and then at its peak probably already. And uh, but but it does seems to have a, a problem now. For example, uh, you you have uh, you have I saw a chart you have done. You know, where, for example, one percent of uh, uh, wealthy uh, uh, in the in the, in the Wall Street or in other countries uh, top percentage, the mass uh, wealth is is really. Uh, uh, equal to the huge uh, population uh, uh, combined, and uh, but then probably uh, China has become a scapegoat for that because uh, we see multinational has been operating worldwide. And I saw another chart you have is that they've been a lot of them has has their uh, you know a lot of profit uh, they had, but the, but not really benefit the host country or the home country, whereas the putting the tax happen. Well, that's really uh, uh, all those uh, populism comes from. And then China, again, has been very centered on that. They take a lot of blame for that. So, so is that global governance is falling behind global practice? And uh, should we have, I mean, recently I noticed uh, President Biden comes up now and say, oh, look, we're going to uh, increase the, uh, 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 the lowest wage of, of, uh, you know, uh, of the workers. Uh, I, I greatly increase that. And also they propose a flag tax for of a global flag test on that. And EU and the US have this digital tax issue. So are we doing some adjustment on that so that uh, everybody's play share, fair share, uh, multinational is doing its great job, uh, uh, you know, rather than China is taking all the blame and then a uh, politician has been self, uh, 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 you know, self-fulfilling prophecy because the uh, populism is, uh, is needs to be uh, they carry the vote, and then uh, it's good bashing China for for getting the <laughs> elected. So, so what do you think about that? You know, this kind of a dilemma that we are in. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, the, even during the pandemic crisis, I mean, the 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 the, the, the most wealthy one percent in U.S. see the value has gone up <laughs> even during the pandemic. Wall Street stock market has all time high. So, but that that is really uh, not benefit trickling down, and uh, and then. Uh, because of the globalization, they benefit. Of course, China benefit too, but, but the thing is that uh, we should have a more equal, more inclusive globalization, particularly for those countries, uh, for those masses at, the, at their own country, at the Western developed countries. And uh, so something can be done in that area. You are the expert, maybe. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, I'm writing a book on this. It's now going to, it's clearly going to be about 150,000 words in English of text. So this is a very large book by uh, this kind of, which I am frightened about. And I feel that I've only touched the surface. Uh, the questions you pose are very deep ones. Um, just to, let's start with sort of the inequality issue. Um, the statistics, such as they are, suggest that there's pretty high level of inequality in China too. But the big difference, of course, is it's pretty clear, given the immense rate of growth in China, that, and I've seen some fairly detailed statistics done on this, um, that everybody in China pretty well has benefited substantially from growth. In the last also years. lived to the 800 million people out of extreme poverty. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. So 90 percent, 95 percent of the population has benefited enormously. So rising inequality matters less. Now, in the West, and particularly in America, particularly in America, uh, the rising inequality has coincide, coincided, and this is controversial and complex, and I won't be able to go into all the statistics, but basically with pretty flat uh, real income growth for a very large part of the population, and particularly the bottom half. And the reason for that is uh, you know, you've got rising inequality of wealth and income. Income is, in my view, more important than wealth, but I won't have time to go into that. Um, when overall productivity growth has been fairly slow. Now, you know, in China, productivity growth has been shooting ahead at six, seven, eight percent a year for decades until relatively recently, when obviously it slowed since 2012. Uh, but in, uh, in the West, it's been much slower. And it's been much slower uh, for two main reasons. Um, well, three. One, we don't fully know. You know, why has productivity growth been relatively slow in America, in the West, in the last 40, 50 years? Very big question, which I won't have time to go into, but we'll put that to one side. 
Uh, but the other reasons clearly are these are already the relatively advanced countries, so they can't gain much from importing new technology from elsewhere. They have to develop it in themselves. And I'm one of the people who believe that the, the new technologies we've been developing, given the structure of our economy, which I can't discuss in detail, but basically the, the domination over time, the increasing domination of personal services, the sorts of services that you can't easily automate in our economies, it's been very difficult to increase productivity. I think that, by the way, in the next 20 years, China will begin to suffer from the same problem. As industry becomes a diminishing force in China, and industry is always the sector, the big sector where productivity growth is fastest, you then end up with lots of other activities, which is much more like hospitals and schools and looking after old people, looking after you, where it's really hard to raise productivity. So you end up with an economy uh, with huge service sector, a lot of it quite stagnant productivity. That may change in future, but that's where we are now. So productivity growth has been slow. Inequality is rising. Logically, that means a very large proportion of the population haven't had improving incomes, and that makes them very angry. And in societies with very div diverse populations, this has created also very clear inter-ethnic friction. And that has allowed pop politicians to play on essentially an ethnic cultural war as part of their political strategy. And that is what I think of as blaming the other internally and also externally, because the other other that you can blame are foreigners. Uh, so the characteristic of right-wing populism, which has become so powerful, is that you blame uh, domestic others and foreign others, uh, if I may use those phrases, for what's gone wrong. And you can see this very strikingly, of course, that's what Donald Trump represented and, it's, and what the Republicans now represent. And you can see similar things, though not to the same degree, in Europe, in Britain and in European countries, in Italy and France, much less in Germany, but it's there. This is there. Uh, very uh, uh, important. This, however, then has a second huge consequence, the return of nationalism. You know, the, and, but here I would like to suggest there is a fundamental moral underpinning of this. So here we've got to get to the really deep conceptual fact, which is related to your question. The capitalist economy tends to be a global economy. It was true in the 19th century. Karl Marx wrote very well on this. I have a long quotation from Karl Marx in my book. Very good. Uh, on the mid 19th century capitalist economy. And the reason for this is very simple. If you're a capitalist, you're, you're in the market. Um, there are opportunities globally, uh, huge opportunities. You know, that's why Chinese entrepreneurs have gone global and American entrepreneurs went global and all the rest of it. So the, the, the world economy, the world capitalist economy is naturally cosmopolitan. That was Marx's base, great insight. I mean, this is a cosmopolitan system, which in many ways is a good thing. And it's an effective system for developing growth uh, uh, you know, the market orientation of the Chinese economy has been very successful, to, for, to give one important example that Dong Xiaoping introduced. Now, but as the economy becomes more global, national control over the economy shrinks inevitably because the economy is more global. It's not in your heart control in the way it used to be. Uh, and government is not global. Government is national. Uh, whatever the political system, and they're very divergent, government is national. Uh, international government rests on the cooperation, but the, essentially the voluntary cooperation of national governments, which have domestic legitimacy and domestic accountability, be it democratic or not. I mean, clearly, it's no question the Communist Party of China feels accountable to the Chinese people, quite rightly. That's their job, right? So that then creates 
a permanent friction in a globalizing system between the logic of the economy, which is global and not really deeply anchored nationally, but to some extent it is, of course, and the logic of politics, which is national. And accountability is national. And in a democracy, this is reflected in the election of people to power who are really running against the global capitalists. You know, what's interesting about American politics is that the right and the left are both now running against the global capitalists. Very extraordinary. Now, in this situation, of course, uh, maintaining the international cooperation among governments needed to create the amount of global order, global governance, global rules in trade, in finance, in dealing with climate, whatever it may be, that's very difficult because all the political forces upon them are national and are forcing them to pay most attention to their domestic citizens. And so it takes very wise statecraft very disciplined to say to people, yeah, we are looking after you. That's what we are trying to do. But cooperating globally is the best way for us to do this. We can adjust our the way we cooperate globally, but actually we can't close off our economies that will impoverish us by agreeing to do things globally, we will actually be able to do better for you here at home. Now, that is the line I would take, of course, but it's not a line that it's easy to sell. It's very sophisticated and rather complex, and it looks as though you're abandoning, na abandoning national sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So, uh, particularly when people are frightened and angry, when there are these huge power shifts, the result is it's very difficult to make that sort of sophisticated argument that I've just made, that the best way to achieve domestic aims is through international economic integration and cooperation. That's where we are. Now, I think Biden very clearly understands this better than Trump. Nobody understood it less than Trump. Uh, really, almost impossible to do less. But, but even he knows he has to um, satisfy domestic constituencies that have been losers. Now, I think mostly they have lost, not entirely, it, but it's not, trade has not been a big factor. Actually. Mostly they've lost, as you've implied, because of domestic political changes, failure to pay taxes, failure to get corporations to pay taxes, uh, the, you know, the strike, the immensely striking thing is that the richest people in America have the lowest tax rate. That's the reality. They have the lowest tax rate. He's, and the way he has to, to deal with that is to make sure they pay taxes. And to do that, he has to in deepen cooperation, which is what he's trying to do on corporation tax and things like that. So the route through better domestic policy goes through better global policy. And this is a very sophisticated game, uh, which is quite difficult to sell. Um, and in terms of relations with China as the as you know as a superpower, uh, um, with a very different political system, it's particularly difficult to sell. So one of the things that I think is happening on the what you might broadly describe the somewhat populist left in the West is it's becoming alliance oriented. Uh, not global, you could you can say it's Western alliance oriented. So it's fragmenting the world, but not into countries, but into alliance systems, which is also very dangerous, by the way. Uh, but that's where it seems to be go. It's a it's a halfway house between purely national economic sovereignty and the uh, and the um, uh, the globalization that seems to me the way it is now going, and obviously, perfectly understandably, China, meanwhile, which is to establish itself as an advanced technology power uh, by developing enormous strength in the technologies that the West has historically dominated, and Westerners, quite a lot of Westerners, regard this as threatening. So. It has become very, very difficult to balance national politics, 
with global cooperation, economic and security politics. And that's where we are. That's where we are now. And I don't know what Graham Allison said to you, but, you know, the most obvious period which had some echoes of this is the period when the West dominated, of course, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And that led to a complete breakdown of the world system. Yeah, no, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Martin. I, I think you're, 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 you're right. You know, um, we, we analyze, of course, this uh, in, in, in depth that, on, on that, uh, uh, you know, the global governance falling behind global capital practice. You, you wrote in your book, Crisis of a D D Democratic Capitalism, which you said capitalism is global and, uh, you know, that uh, democracy is local. <laughs> That's a very good uh, uh, summary of that. So, so if we have this kind of a contradictory uh, uh, end on both sides, and then so capitalism is, is really have a free, wide, you know, uh, 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 running around the world and then benefit all the uh, top, uh, top uh, elite. Whereas uh, democracy is local, they, they felt they were, they were uh, really uh, suffered or didn't have yep. an equal opportunity, then they are constantly self-generating and self-generating all those uh, uh, local politicians that bashing globalization and bashing global, global uh, uh, capitalism in, in, the, in the global. So I think you're absolutely right. So the, the solution for that is, you know, first of all, I think the international cooperation still needs to be uh, enhanced, strengthened, and, uh, you know, being the pandemic fighting or climate change, let's build up some trust. Otherwise, we're going to be driven far apart by these uh, uh, ideological and value differences, so-called, right? And you actually uh, uh, said very well. I mean, you, you, you remember, I read somewhere that you were, first came to China in 1993. <laughs> you, you stayed in, the, uh, in Shanghai Peace Hotel, uh, you know, across the river. You, uh, the, 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 you know, you see the Pudong, and then you see how that has gradually uh, changed uh, in the last several decades. So, so China actually, we, we just had the, the uh, population census data coming out of yesterday. And then you see China has 1.1 billion people now, uh, still going a little bit. But the, the amount of population who has a college education is almost 220 million. That's enormous, the largest uh, well-trained uh, uh, you know, uh, population in the world now. And then the, the younger population uh, uh, between, uh, you know, uh, below the 14 years old is still, still quite, uh, quite, quite, quite a lot, 70%. And then, of course, the, one of the problems is that uh, the, the age before 60 is get, you know, it's getting even higher. And, uh, but the mean age is about 38 something, which is still relevant, uh, you know, younger than many Western countries. So, so, so the things now, I, I think is the, is the value now we, where we have to, see the, uh, uh, the difference. So, so, you know, China, I, I was talking to Graham Allison or uh, Joseph Nye or uh, Tom Friedman, no, no one agreed on the Cold War. So, you know, we shouldn't fight the Cold War. We, we are already in a, uh, it's a bad energy and, uh, and we are already intertwined. The, the problem I think now, uh, why is the, 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 the global governance falling behind local politics is strong than, and the global politics. The other thing is that of course, the, do we recognize a peaceful rise in China? I mean, that, that is a thing that we, you know, nobody will deny if they come to China, you know, that the transformation going on is beyond recognition in the last four decades uh, since Deng Xiaoping opened up. And, uh, uh, you know, now China is, uh, is uh, contributed one third of a global uh, GDP growth. It's the largest trading nation with 130 countries. It's actually, it's, it's the top category of a pr pr producer of uh, over 200 uh, products uh, classified by the United Nations. And of course, second largest donor to the UN system. And, uh, you know, going on. And so China does export uh, uh, famine or refugees and not even ideology as you pointed out some time ago. So why, why can't, uh, the, you know, the world have a different view on China and maybe a uh, you know, let's have a peaceful competition, like, like let's do Olympic stuff, you know, I mean, uh, uh, rather than really thinking this is uh, something, this model, you know, our model is the best. If China doesn't converge, then let's really uh, place them as a, as a, a rival number one, you know. We, 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 there could be some rivalry, as uh, Joseph and I, both Joseph and I and Graham Allen said, you know, let's cooperative rivalry or rivalry partner, using their words. So can we really reach that kind of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, trend in the future, rather than we, we are, you know, uh, self-reinforcing each other and, and 
I mean, Blinky said, let's, let's go, go up, not, go, not compare going down, let's compare going up. So can we do something going up? And uh, how, how, how would you advise that, you know, I mean, uh, from your assessment? Okay, um, so this is such a huge question. Um, I think the, um, one of the questions that I've been thinking about is, let us suppose China were, uh, had a political system like ours, uh, would we feel differently about it? Um, it's a very interesting question because it's quite possible that the answer is no. Mm -hmm. That is to say, though I don't think it is fully no, that um, simply such an enormous shift in the balance of global power, which you've described very well, um, uh, creates uncertainty and uh, and fear everywhere else. And that's what the Thucydides trap is about. And that would happen even if there were no, absolutely no ideological elements in it at all. Um, but of course there are, um, and there's also history. So I've always assumed that some substantial degree of friction was inevitable. Um, and we just have to accept that. We, we do have nationally based global politics. The question, second, are there any analogies from the past that help us to think about this? I agree with you completely. The Cold War is a hopeless analogy um, because uh, it was a pure ideological competition we had almost no economic relations between the West and the Soviet Union. They were almost completely independent entities. And the Soviet Union was not really at any stage. It was a military rival, no question, but not an economic one. So this is a, not a useful model. We are enormously economically integrated with China. Uh, China is a huge economic power, will become a bigger one. And uh, we also share a world which we now see we have to look after together. So that makes managed cooperation simply the only way we can possibly do this. Of course, the one thing we do share with the Cold War period, which it must be evident, that war is unthinkable. War has been unthinkable since the invention of the nuclear weapon. So it just has to be put outside any thought uh, uh, the possibility of actual war between superpowers. Now, so how does cooperation work? Um, I think you have to break down the elements in it in a pragmatic way. Um, there are the global commons, and they have to be separated. They can't all be dealt with together, and they must be dealt with pragmatically. The global commons, climate, the oceans, the protection of species, there are big issues here in which China will be centrally involved and will have to do a lot. And I think China will have to do a lot more than it's now planning in all these areas. And that will be quite tough for China, as well as for us, of course. Um, and that, so that's a huge challenge, but that is in China's interest too. So I think there's hope. Then there are managing security relations in such a way that they're stable. So everybody understands what their fundamental interests are and manages them without friction. It's absolutely crucial. And I don't think it's happening enough. Then there's economics. Um, and here, uh, I believe the West has legitimate concerns with Chinese behavior. Um, and I'm sure China has legitimate concerns with Western behavior. My own view is, one, both sides need to define what they regard as their absolutely core security interests in technology, which are legitimate. And they have to say these sectors are ones we are going to make sure are nationally independent. And we will agree that. And that will have impacts for trade, and we'll just accept that. It's pretty clear that's going to happen. There are core technologies both sides want to control for their own sake. 
fine. Everything else should be conducted according to normal rules of trade, but they have to be reciprocal and equal. I think the way Trump went around about this was mad, but there is a case for a profound negotiation between China and major powers on a new trade order, uh, a, a new trade system um, with new rules which are more legitimate and work better. Some of them will be tighter and some of them will be looser. They will be different. I think that is now required. We can't go on as we've been and pretend the WTO system and the two, two, 2001 um, a China accession is still the last word on this relationship. So that has to be done. And then we have immensely important areas where we need to cooperate, like health, uh, um, the, uh, the, um, uh, like health, uh, development, debt, uh, which is a big problem. China is a big creditor. We're big creditors where there just has to be active day-to-day -day cooperation. And that will require considerable changes in international economic and organizations. It's a tremendous agenda. And it won't do, I think, anymore just to go back to where we were 15 years ago. We have to think of it forward. And uh, that will require immensely imaginative statescraft in the West and in China, and that's the agenda. Mm -hmm. Yes, great. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that uh, you, you gave a lot of uh, deep thinking on that as well. I, I was always wondering, you know, I mean, <clears throat> China probably the rise of China, peaceful rise of China is a, is a blessing to the, to the world. You can hear me, okay, okay. So, so what, what, I, what I think is that, uh, uh, you know, maybe we, when we look at the development of the last hundred years or fifty years of uh, of the global uh, globalization and development, maybe uh, we are we are seeing the technology development has 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 hugely transformed the, the international business and environment. We see the uh, the the modern uh, you know the connectivity has really uh, you know also the social media, the older things has really. Uh, uh, you know, beyond the recognition, change the world. So we cannot use the old way of measurement. It looks like we are still using the uh, 20th century uh, measurement to the 21st century reality, uh, particularly with China. For example, China now with a uh, 5,000 years history, you know, basically it's restored its uh, probably rightful place uh, in history. And, uh, and also uh, it has its own logic, you know, the, the, the respect, uh, Seniority. There's always a strong central government due to the large irrigation and uh, uh, in a huge population and uh, and things like that. And then, and China also have some kind of a collectivism where they have showed a great effectiveness during the pandemic fighting. Uh, you know, sacrifice a little bit of human uh, freedom on that. But also, you can see also that uh, uh, we have uh, 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 the the other thing is the uh, uh, you know we 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 saw that uh, in the. Uh, uh, like the, the, the culture of Oriental, uh, East Asian culture, even, even Japan is always uh, uh, ruled by, uh, by one party. I mean, <laughs> briefly by, by social uh, Democrats, but largely ruled by peoples. And, and then, uh, you know, Singapore. I mean, you look at those uh, East Asian uh, culture as well. So, so I'm, think, I'm thinking, you know, you know Chinese uh, uh, system, uh, it works for China very well and uh, lifted 800 million people out of poverty where Larry Summers said something compatible to the industrial revolution of the of the Brit British Empire you know uh, in, in the last several hundred years so so it's really uh, uh, how we can get that uh, accepted also Chinese economy now is, is a hybrid you know you had, you had a, a right balance of uh, uh, private sector 60 percent you have another 10 50 percent multinational have another 20 percent maybe soe 10 50 percent and then land is also owned by the uh, public and private so it's really easy to do infrastructure do all those uh, so those are maybe and also the government play a bigger role in terms of you know doing infrastructure doing all those uh, 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 one billion uh, uh, smartphone users you know china has already uh, 1.4 billion, 1.3 billion people covered as some kind of Medicare, the largest medic coverage in the world. One billion has been covered by the social security of some sort. So, so what, what, what went wrong? I mean, can we have a new system? 
the compatible or comparable, it's not the Fukuyama sounds the end of history. I mean, can we have a, a you know, you know, I've been using the, 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 the Joseph Nye's words, maybe 2035, we'll see people get gradually accepted that, or maybe we, we see the better, better relation then. So this is a reagonizing process. Uh, you know, if, uh, so how, how China can do better, I mean, to, to explain China better to the world. I mean, also the narratives that we, we hope to shape in and uh, maybe to have a better understanding communication. I mean, China is living in a world now. We, uh, you know, we are living in a world of democracy as well. I mean, the largest opposition party is the United States, probably EU as well. China is watched by thousands of media, social uh, networks. The Chinese top leaders are, is, is constantly read that just uh, uh, from around the world, they're constantly changing that. And China has this kind of a democ consultative democracy. All the elites get together. You know, the 14th five years plan had a 1 million comments and the re revision the suggestions are throughout the country. So it's kind of a different, uh, you know, democratic for, you know, for process. Can this, can this kind of a new uh, system be accepted or peacefully coexisted? with the rest of the world, rather than we have to mention. So I mean, one, one uh, European uh, leader, uh, one said, you know, China lifted 800 million people out of poverty. Just imagine 10% of that become refugee. I mean, 2 million of the Middle East refugees from Syria has already, you know, uh, distorted the whole Europe by the uh, deglobalization de and the bring access. If 10% of the Chinese uh, poverty people didn't get out of poverty, become a refugee flooded the world, we may have an even worse situ situation now. So. Can we really live with a, a peaceful China? And uh, how can China do better to do that? Um, God, that's an enormous set of questions. Um, so there are two, I think there are, I could respond to this in two different ways. One, which is my personal views on China, its likely evolution and its system. And the other is <clears throat> to look at this as it were, as a human being from Mars, which obviously I'm not. Um, and to say, well, how might you be able to resolve this? Um, the, as I've been implying, um, an enormous amount of this, at least 50%, possibly two thirds, is just about relative power. And power matters to people. Surely I don't have to explain that to a Chinese person. Uh, you know, the Chinese empire was a power structure. It is, always has been. And so we have, uh, I think perfectly from the Chinese point of view, completely legitimate and appropriate um, restoration of normal power relations from your point of view. Perfectly understandable. Perfectly reasonable. <coughs> But from the Western point of view, particularly from the US point of view, this is a, tr a transformation of power relations um, downwards. People don't like becoming relatively weaker because it constrains your freedom of action. That's what power means. Power is the ability to do what you like. Becoming relatively weaker means you can do less of what you would like or it becomes costlier in some way. And people don't like that. That's what politics have always been about in all systems. The most basic, they're about power. So we are in the middle of a huge shift in relative power. And the people who are at the wrong end of this shift don't like it. And that's what the Thucydides trap is about. And this has nothing to, that's, that's what I said. Would it make, let us suppose the Chinese system today were just like us, obviously ridiculous, but would we still have these resentments? And the answer is, yeah, we would have a lot of these resentments, as I said, at least 50%. So this, has, this wouldn't be resolved by any of the issues that you mentioned. Uh, you know, if the, the explaining China to the world wouldn't resolve any of that because the power shift is real. Uh, and the power shift is, of course, associated with the great success. Uh, lifting 800 million people out of power, poverty is why China is now a huge power and will become more so. So there's the power thing. Power sh relations can only be managed. 
And power relations have to be managed through systems that generate trust. This is absolutely central. And systems develop trust by acting in ways on both sides that uh, give confidence in one another. And um, a lot of things have happened on both sides which have undermined it. It's just a reality. I can go through the list. You know the list. That's just how it is. Uh, and these have been mistakes made by us and, and mistakes, in my view, made by China. Uh, quite big ones. So that's the first sign. Then there's the governance issue. And then I'll come to the, uh, the economics one. Um, China is historically, as you rightly say, a distinct civilization. It's the, it is, in fact, the heart of a distinct East Asian civilization, uh, which is very old. And the countries you mention, Japan, uh, Korea, obviously, Singapore, for different reasons, uh, are all part of that Chinese system of ideas. Uh, and they are very, very different, very different from the Western tradition. And I could just talk about that for a long time because it's be a huge interest of me. Mine, most people don't know, but long before I became an economist, I spent years studying the ancient European, ancient Greek and ancient Latin. And so I know something about the history of Western culture. And I've always been very interested in Chinese philosophy and the differences, right? Also in Indian, by the way. So, so you have these... Uh, very different civilizations. So it was always likely that China would become uh, a very different sort of political system from anything in the West, and that it would never be a, a liberal democracy in our sense. It was perfectly clear that that was very, very unlikely to happen, um, which is not itself a problem, as long as you can do business with it, which means that it's predictable. The particular form it's taken in China is to a Western, and I've made this point somewhat puzzling, uh, because uh, to us, communism is a Western philosophy and, uh, and one we haven't accepted. So that's quite strange. But the core of it is clearly what you say, and we can understand that's fundamentally different. Because of that, China operates in ways that we find very difficult to accept and like on quite important issues. And the same is true for us, for Chinese people. You've emphasized, for instance, our indifference in many countries, particularly in US, US to rising inequality without doing anything about it. Well, that sort of seems crazy, doesn't it? So um, we have to live with difference. We have to live with profound difference. Um, while managing the power relations. That's very tricky if things happen which either side regard as fundamentally unacceptable. Um, but living with difference is the second huge challenge. Uh, and, and I don't think explaining yourselves would help much here. I don't think Westerners fundamentally misunderstand what China is. Some do, obviously lots do, but reasonably well-informed Westerners understand what China is. They just can't really accept that there is another way of being modern. They, you know, it just doesn't fit in with the universalism, which is so characteristic of Western thinking. Westerners are universalists. This goes back a long way. I could go into that. The final, uh, the final point is, we have all these economic relations. And as I said, I think the way to resolve these is to separate out core security questions because in a world of power, security matters from everything else. And that's a difficult, the border will change. And I think it can be done to some extent by mutual agreement. Um, but we have to define what we regard as vital national interests and what we don't and deal with them in the economic sphere. So my approach to this will be slightly different from yours. I don't think we'll ever, I think there's gonna be a real problem in ever reaching a world in which everybody likes one another. But the truth is we live in our countries with people we don't like very much, and that's quite normal. 
Uh, problems of this kind have to be managed pragmatically. In a, they're not going to be managed by everybody saying, well, actually, we really all like one another. It would help, as I once said, if we were invaded by people from Mars, but we're not going to be invaded by people from Mars. So we have a lot in, of interests in common, a lot of values that we do share, and we have to build on those to manage a very long-term future, which will be complicated. Um, and certainly explaining each other to one another would be sensible. Uh, but accepting difference and managing it is what this is about. This will be more difficult for the West than for China. Um, and in some areas, it will create very severe friction. But I think it's manageable. Um, and that seems to me the mature way to handle this. Nobody's going to win. It's impossible for one side to win. Uh, so the, the, the only way to deal with this is to manage it. Yeah, no, thank, thanks, uh, uh, Marta. You have, you know, quite objective uh, an analysis of the situation. I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, you, 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 your new book, you know, uh, Capital Democracy, you know, uh, that uh, capital is global and the democracy is local. Have we reached some kind of a stage that even democracy, the concept that, that has been originated 2000 years ago uh, by our Greek philosophies, Maybe with the modern technology and the modern huge population, when, when the democracy concept was born, it was probably the whole world, probably less than 100 million people. Now it's, uh, you know, 75 billion, 7.5 billion. Should we upgrade that uh, notion? Because, you know, there could be a different format of that. You know, one man, one vote maybe works in an individual uh, list uh, center society. Whereas this consultative uh, democracy, uh, meritocracy, like, uh, like just imagine a, 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 a government official in China, you know, if he's going to be promoted a minister, governor, he has to do two years at the rural areas has a, and then has a, at the county level, at the municipality level, at the provincial level, at the government level, and finally at the, you know, Politburo Standing Committee. There was many, many ranks and, and uh, you know, there were thousand years of Mandarin system in China that has been selecting through that process. So, so, and now just imagine there's 200 million, uh, over 200 million college graduates in China now, uh, accounting uh, 12, 10%, uh, you know, 15% of the whole population. You know, that's, that's a probably a new format. And uh, again, technology, you know, uh, uh, one billion smartphone user, every, every day he's using smartphone voting, you know, where to buy, where to shop, where to go, what job to take, where, where to, uh, uh, you know, which newspaper to reach. They are really have a lot of choice. And also probably the human rights concept has to be upgraded as well. I mean, look at uh, uh, this pandemic fighting is, is a good example. You know, people in the West doesn't, doesn't want to be locked down and is violating their human right. Whereas China accepted that. And then China is the most free country uh, in the world in terms of the last May Day holiday, the boom of 700 million people travel around for, for the domestic tourism boom uh, uh, unprecedented. So, I'm just thinking of this technology democracy, this market democracy, and then all those things combined. Maybe, uh, you know, China is experimenting with some new model, with meritocracy, and with all those kind of, a, uh, and also just imagine the synergy that China has with uh, everywhere you go is a few hours now uh, by speed train, high speed train, and then uh, 5G, uh, you know, there's about 1 million uh, stations on 5G, 4 million 4G stations, it's such a highly uh, artificial intelligent, you know, the, 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 the power of the world now. So, so if China is doing well, and then you could lift the world out of this. You are absolutely right with compared with Mars. If we're attacked by Mars, we're all human beings. Well, you know, we should help each other. I was really uh, uh, surprised to see we are, we are fighting pandemic. And big countries don't talk to each other. Big countries even uh, not really is, is busy on, on other front of a set of allies against uh, countries not set up alliance against the virus. That's really uh, 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 very, very sad to see. So I, I'm just thinking how, you know, and the other, of course, China needs to do better as well, explain, explain itself, maybe more, more open, more journalists to come, have more tourism, have welcome more foreign students. China is willing to learn from other countries. You know, China has, uh, uh, since China opened up, there's 7 million Chinese students study around the world. Probably less than a million foreign students come to China, you know. So uh, I think there's a lot of things that we could do better uh, uh, among each other. And, uh, but, but 
fundamentally, are we having uh, some kind of a new, you know, uh, uh, running of the country, for example? I mean, <laughs> we cannot, if China doesn't converge, uh, since China joined WTO, if China doesn't converge, oh, you are not one of us, you are the other aliens, you know, we're going to uh, contain you, we're going to, we're going to bash you. Can we avoid that kind of mentality? Well, the, yeah. you've raised so many different issues. And I think the perfectly legitimate points from the, the Chinese point of view. Um, okay, I have the following sorts of reactions. Um, first, there are general, genuine conflicts of interest. Um, you know, the South China Sea is a conflict of interest. Um, you might say you have one point of view, we have another point of view. Um, that's just a straight conflict of interest, has to be managed. Um, then there are conflicts of values, as you've said. Now, the way you present it seems to suggest that you, and it may be true, by the way, I have no idea, that in the end, we will converge, if we're sensible, on Chinese values, but we're not going to. Um, the, uh, the fundamental assumptions that underpin contemporary Western culture are very deeply rooted in um, our history, probably not 5,000 years, but let's say two and a half thousand. Um, and uh, they're essentially a marriage of uh, Greek, ancient Greek and Judeo-Christian. And the Jewish part of it goes back probably three and a half thousand years. These are not going to change. Uh, um, so our culture, for a whole host of reasons, is more individualistic, more law-based, uh, less bureaucracy-based. Um, and though we have... Uh, converged on in very important ways. We, you know, we we develop bureaucracies in important ways in imitation of China. It's not an accident that we call our top bureaucrats in Britain mandarins. That's what we call them. And, you know, that's not an accident. Of course, our bureaucracies mostly originated actually with the church bureaucracy, the Catholic Church influence on Western history can never be exaggerated. So I don't want to go into all this. I can go on forever. But democracy is, has proved representative government, it, which is modern, by the way. It's a British invention. No, it's basically British invention. It's very different from the ancient world. But democracy has always proved very adaptable and flexible. We've been, mainly, been able to import bureaucracy into it, which is quite meritocratic. So we have a mixture of meritocratic, bureaucratic and representative elements in our constitution with this enormous role for the law. It's a composite civilization and it should not be simplified. And some of it is very close to China and some of it's very, very different. It will evolve. It has always evolved. It has to evolve now because it's in terrible trouble, just as 200 years ago, your old imperial system was in terrible trouble and had to collapse to create a new Chinese system. And what you have in China today is clearly rooted in the Chinese past, but it's a new Chinese system. Um, and that may well happen to us, but it will happen internally. It will happen as a result of internal, external pressures. And I think in the meantime, and the meantime is at least the next half century or so, we have to live with rather different assumptions about how things will work. And we will see who overall does better. And it seems to me, looking at it, that China does some things incredibly well, above all, anything that involves mass mobilization of resources. Uh, China's system is staggering. And there are things we do rather well uh, in terms of ideas, in terms of creativity, um, in terms of uh, flexibility, there are things we do well. Um, and I think from the human point of view, from the human point of view, it would be good if both civilizations function and develop and we learn from one another. I think historically, as I've already told you, we learned from China. Uh, we learned about government from China. This is largely forgotten. And of course, obviously, China's learned from the West in the last um, 
century, I would say, uh, uh, and certainly in, the, in the, uh, the period of the communist rule. So, but we have to accept that we're going to remain different. Now, that creates really big interface problems in important areas, and they're not trivial ones. You mentioned human rights. Well, these are sort of core things for Westerners, and they are going to go on being core things. Maybe they shouldn't be, but they are. Where did core right, where does in human rights come from in the Western tradition? It comes on from the fundamental idea that every individual is a spark of God. Every individual matters to God, and they matter as individuals to God. You can't take God out of the West. We've tried quite hard, but it's still there in one form or the other. So you just have to accept that will go on. That individualism will go on. Um, and human rights, that means a system which is based on the idea of collective rights and collective responsibilities like yours will not, will interface badly. Then uh, uh, you want to innovate and, you know, develop technology to the highest possible degree. Um, we don't want to be dependent entirely on Chinese technology. Um, we think that will be rather concerning. I can understand that. So... That means our governments are going to become more active. They're going to become more like yours. We're going to pay, spend more money on building our own technologies and developing and protecting them. And that, in this respect, I think what Biden is doing, interestingly, I think Biden thinks that what he's doing is what the Chinese do. Right? That's why he's spending all his money. So we're learning from you. An active state. Spend lots of money. Uh, no, that's not new. The West has been there before. Uh, you know, the American state create, basically created the railroad system and the, and the highway system that linked it together. Then for 40 years, they forgot all about it. And now we're learning. This is important. We're becoming like you. So we'll learn from one another and we will remain different from one another, profoundly different. And there will be friction, lots of it, because you have attitudes to things that are happening, say in Hong Kong, whatever it might be, which we don't share. We cannot live in this world together if we expect everybody to agree. That it may be possible within a country, but it won't happen. And living with difference is possible as long as you realize what you share as human beings and the planet, which is very fragile, and peace, which is very important to everybody. And as you said, last word, the one thing you get out of this crisis is Chinese government cares about the lives of Chinese people, and we care about the people, the lives of our people. We did it rather badly, but we've learned. We're not going to do this, make these mistakes again. We now understand what a pandemic is. We won't do those mistakes again. We will learn. And then we've got to learn to live with one another. That's the great task. And in the end, we will say, okay, these people are different from us, but we're still human. We can learn a lot from one another and we can share ideas as we've done today. And I've enjoyed it enormously. And I said, hope you have to. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Martin. It's absolutely, uh, I found this very enlightening and stimulating talking to you. You've been so uh, uh, wide, uh, open-minded and then you actually uh, mentioned about, you know, we can learn from each other. Absolutely, China is always, uh, uh, you know, science and democracy in, in, a, in, a, in a May Force movement about 100 years ago. China was learning from West all the, all, the, all the time along. Opening up is largely open to the West. You know, when China, Deng Xiaoping said in 1979, 78, December, they had a, a third plan of the 11th Party Congress. And on January 1st, they established diplomatic ties with the US. So absolutely right. You know, our dialogue is really uh, fascinating. We had about 1 million uh, viewers. I mean, my, my staff showed me uh, now watching us. and. Uh, what I, what I, I, I want to uh, find out maybe two, one or two questions is that your article, you recently wrote an article about China, China is wrong to think U.S. facing inevitable decline, and which is widely read in China. I mean, you summarize well all the competitive uh, strength of U.S., you know, the best universities, uh, venture capitals, and, uh, you know, corporate uh, multinationals are leading on that. So all those are great, uh, great stuff. And, uh, you know, Probably, you know, also one of the things I think the U.S. is doing very well, including uh, Western countries too, is attracting global talent. I mean, uh, Singapore, uh, Lee Guangyou, former Prime Minister, uh, said China is picking talent from 1.3 billion people 
whereas the U.S. is picking talents from 7 billion people. That's probably one of the core advantages that U.S. has. So if the if U.S. is doing well from zero to one, and China has this 1.41 1 <laughs> biggest population in the world, biggest application seen that, uh, uh, that they can apply the technology. So U.S. is doing well from zero to one, and China is doing well from one to 10, one to 100. Can we all display our competitive advantage that David Ricardo has said, you know, let's do us better. You know, China is also relatively still, uh, the population uh, dividend is still continue will for some year. I mean, also China is doing well uh, on other things. I mean, according to the Global Innovation Index, you know, China hosts the 17 of the top science technology cluster worldwide with, with Shenzhen, Hong Kong, Guangdong, uh, Great Bay and, and Beijing. And also China is actually now uh, the, uh, they have the, uh, on the painting applications now. First time surpassed the US as the largest painting country uh, in the intellectual property rights uh, on that. And also China's university is, is catching up. So, so what, what I'm thinking is that if we you know, relatively say, okay, uh, everybody has its uh, advantage and disadvantage. If US is doing well on the, on the innovation, on the, on the uh, on global, uh, you know, uh, uh, multinationals and, and China is doing great on its market. You know, you, you just imagine it's already have 400 million uh, middle class, you know, in the next 10, 15 years, we may have 8 million middle class coming up. It's great for the world. I mean, let's all benefit from each other rather than we have to really, uh, 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 you know, decouple or contain or we have a different system. So can we really, uh, uh, have a have a this a competitive advantage series still you know which is a famous U, U, UK <laughs> economist uh, that has proposed that can we can still practice that? Well, we can't decouple. That's clear, and we mustn't decouple. Um, the uh, that's clear from what I've argued. Um, I think having deep e economic relations is a good thing. Uh, both because it makes us more prosperous and because it gives a strong mutual interest in one another's fate. Um, and um, it also leads to exchanges of ideas, knowledge, uh, and understanding. So all this is very, very important. Uh, but I also think, as I said, that um, the reality of the relations among states is always one of power. Kissinger, who, after all, is one of the great bridge individuals, always talks about the balance of power. And I think we are going to need to maintain a stable balance of power um, because it's when it starts being destabilized that possibilities of conflict arise. That's, that's what Graham is arguing. And the one aspect of power is obviously technological. So I do expect an ongoing technological rivalry. How that should work out uh, is important. I don't want to get into the details of, do I think the Western attitude to Huawei made any sense? As far as I can see, it didn't. Um, but the it seems to me obvious that Western powers above all the US are going to try and maintain technological autonomy in certain areas which they regard as central to their security. And that's normal and can be perfectly well managed within a world which is open in all other uh, respects. I think there should be movement of people. Um, I myself think it is, and this will no doubt be regarded as offensive, and I understand the uh, um, the sensitivities on China's side. But I think that uh, I actually think in terms of information flows, we are going to have to tighten up on what is allowed on our internet. And I think you're going to have to loosen what is allowed on your internet. So we are more even in that regard. I mean, we obviously have allowed the internet to become a perfect media for the dissemination of lies and this is unbelievably dangerous for our stability. Um, I won't go back into the question of what democracy means now, because that would take half an hour. I have you know, I've written a book on it. Uh, but anyway, um, so, but I, I think at the same time that the level of censorship in your system has to decline. Uh, the, um, 
uh, the openness to the world in terms of knowing what's going on. Journalism is very, very important. That has to be maintained on both sides. We need to be uh, to be uh, uh, even if you don't like it, allowed to report, and the same applies, of course, to Chinese journalists in the West. We need to be open to one another in that fundamental respect. So I believe that the that the the rivalry which uh, Joe and uh, Graham talked about, and it is rivalry. We have to be realistic um, and be perfectly well managed without. You know, you know, if you like, cooperative rivalry uh, in such a way that everybody benefits. But the situation is not what it was 30 years ago, 25 years ago. Uh, and the other side of this is China is now a superpower and a rising one. And China will have to say to itself, OK, um, what sort of world do we want? How do we feel about the institutions of the world order? Uh, how do we interact with them? How do we want to shape them? How can we do that in ways that give other powers a sense of security and to fit in uh, with our system? Now, this is a completely new challenge. I've made this point many times. The ch challenge for the West is obvious. Uh, we discussed this. There's also a huge challenge for China in this sense. Historically, China was the largest for most, for a, at least a large part of the last two and a half, 2,000 years. China was the biggest and richest place in the world. But it was because of the technology of the time it was largely isolated from the rest of the world and its neighbors were much, much smaller. So this is the first time in Chinese history that China is a great power within the world as a whole. And the world is a biggish place. China has 1.4 billion people, as you rightly say, but the world has about eight. And it has other powers and other interests so China, for the first time in its history, is a great power, fully restored, operating within a global system that it cannot dominate. And the same, by the way, is true of the West and the US. They don't understand this, yes. The West has been so used to dominating, it's not, it finds it almost impossible to get used to the idea it can't anymore. Uh, but I think the same problem in a different way arises with China. So there is a way in which China has to think through, okay, we did incredibly well and rose to this immense stature in a world which, whose institutions were, were Western largely and in which the West thought it was dominant. That period is over, and we don't accept that anymore. Fine, no problem with that. Um, but, okay, how do we fit into this world? We are different. We have different political systems and orders. Everyone is different. We're all different. So how do we make a reasonable order from our point of view in this, do we wish to merely to maintain the autonomy of the Chinese state? Do we want to create a large number of tribute states around us? How do we relate to the other great powers? What is a sensible way of doing this? I think there's a lot of thinking beyond the peaceful rise. You know, the peaceful rise has happened. The rise has happened. Of course, China's a long way to go. It's still relatively poor. It's a lot of development. But China, as you pointed out, is now a leading power. By the way, the point about the patents was in my article. I made that point in the article. China is clearly a major power. I was merely trying to point out that the US is not yet finished. Uh, that's all. Um, so I think there's a big challenge for China, too, in working out, well, where does China fit into this world? What does it, how does it want the world to be ordered? So take one specific example we've gone through many the world trade organization it's pretty obvious that the world trade organization as it is now doesn't really work i'm just we haven't had a successful global negotiation since 1995 not a really except the chinese accession um uh, the WTO is not able to handle the US-China conflict. That's obvious. That's why they went out of it. Uh, do we want 
does China want a new system? What would it look like? I don't know. Um, the uh, Does China think it will be okay if the system collapsed? Probably not. I don't know. Um, so I've been giving speeches in China every time I would come to the China Development Forum. I think the first speech I ever gave there was in 2010. And I said, you know, what is your Chinese view as a leader of the world trading system? What is China's view on the future of the trading system? I asked. And I think the que the, uh, that's a question that is still no answer. Um, by the way, I think the same is true on the monetary system, though your previous PBOC governor talked about that. So I want China to be a leader. I want China to come forward with its ideas on how this new world is to run. Um, I think that will be very challenging. It won't be the way it was in 2005. That's over. But it, we need, I agree with you completely, to, risk, to have a working relations, cooperative relations, despite immense differences and frictions which will never go, differences on views on human rights and things like this. They're not going to go. Um, and I would be very grateful for strong Chinese positions in the world on how you want to take this forward. Uh, you hear a lot from the U.S., because it's used to this, but you don't hear me much from China, um, except the idea, which I understand is things were fine as the way they were. Why don't we keep them that way? From your point of view, that's absolutely right. They were, but we're not going to go back. Um, so I, I think China is at a point in which, um, and this is a big point I've been making, that we want more leadership from China. Uh, and we will probably disagree violently. Well, but we'll disagree about real things. Uh, and that's fine. That's fine. I don't have any problem with that, as long as it's peaceful and it's ultimately aimed at managing relations. Great. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, you, you have this, uh, uh, you know, expectation that China should be more actively on the international sea. I agree with you. I think China should. And of course, there's, uh, you know, the, 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 the international order is really made by uh, you know, U.S. led and Britain Wood system, and uh, uh, you know, all English speaking and uh, international, or, you know, continental mm. law or, or, or common law system. So, so China is actually a late comer for that. So it, it, it takes time. But I, I agree, China should to do more. And now, the newly appointed WTO DJ uh, announced that uh, there are four deputy WTO direct general has been appointed and one, one of them is from China, a former, uh, you know, the vice minister uh, uh, from commerce, uh, you know, uh, he, he will be the, uh, the new uh, DJ, Zhang Xiangchen, you know, <laughs> vice minister Zhang Xiangchen, now is the new uh, deputy director of WTO. So, so, so I agree, we need to learn from more from, uh, you know, Western countries, how to be more active internationally. That's actually naturally connected to some of the questions we, we collected that we, before our event, we announced you're you coming and there's quite a number of questions posed to, to you. And one of them is about this international order. Uh, this news is, uh, uh, this question is from Hongxin News uh, saying that, uh, uh, you know, just like the magazine of a political said in 2020, the old world order is already dead or gone. Maybe country lose their trust because of each other, uh, between each other. And there's also a backlash against globalization and, and the future international economic order. Uh, so, 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 so I, I actually personally, I think also, you know, this question is that uh, relevant is that, uh, for example, China has, has one experiment, which I think done very well, is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. China has actually, you know, taken initiative and 103 country, four country participate, the largest multilateral a successful company China has, and uh, India is the largest recipient of the AIB loans. I, I know that uh, President Biden also now uh, uh, proposed uh, 2.3 trillion on the infrastructure. So infrastructure could be one of the biggest uh, low in hand food for the, for the world to have in the next uh, several decades. And China has already developed capacity and financially, technologically, coupled with multinational you know, legal advice and uh, consultants from Nigerian uh, consultants and from West country. Maybe we could work together. Uh, can we have a global infrastructure investment bank rather than, you know, upgrade that? 
So we can, US and China, EU, we can create a large pie and work together. So, so for the new Britain World Movement, also international climate change could be something to, to, to grow us together and the pandemic fighting. And so we need to find more common um, tasks or challenges that we work together as a human being and mankind. Uh, so what do you think about that on the new global order, how we can really shape a new- I think that's, uh, yeah. I think having common tasks, shared tasks is very important. And uh, I think that one of the best ways of, of managing this relationship is to these tasks. And you've mentioned some very, very important ones. Um, I think uh, the AIB is a great success. Uh, um, it's been with an exceptional governance system um, and uh, creating institutions like that is excellent. Um, the, uh, in each of these areas that you mentioned, climate, um, infrastructure, uh, pandemic, so forth, there are clearly possibilities, very important possibilities. Um, there are also some really pretty big uh, problems in all these areas, perhaps because we haven't talked enough to one another. On the infrastructure side, for example, um, obviously the core of this at the moment is the BRI. Uh, and uh, there's been very little Western involvement in this, and there's a lot of Western suspicion. Uh, suspicion about its geopolitical purpose and suspicion about the terms of the debts and the debt problems that have arisen out of it. And uh, by the way, let me make clear, I'm not blaming China on this. I'm just saying this is the fact. Um, the BRI can be, could be seen as uh, uh, a power play by China or as a step by China to participate in the global future by using its enormous strengths. And I think the way that those doubts can be resolved is by opening up to discussion um, the way the BRI works. Uh, I think there are some big issues there. By the way, there's some objective big issues. It's clearly debt problems that have arisen. And then that leads to a second question, which, um, which has become a very big one, and I've been involved in discussions this in this in the last couple of years, through three years, which is China is a very important creditor in the world now, um, which is great success. And of course, we're now going to move into a world in which we're going to have a lot of bad debt. There's going to be a lot of bad debt after the pandemic. So one of the questions is, how are we going to go negotiate all this? Um, how is bad debt going to be negotiated? Let's suppose you've got a country that owes a lot to uh, the Bretton Woods institutions, a lot to Western private interests, uh, a lot to Western governments, and they owe a lot to Chinese companies and chi the Chinese government. Um, in this situation, negotiating debt is virtually impossible because nobody will want to reduce their debt because they will say, this is it. I'm going to pay the price and the other creditors will do get their money back. That's not fair. <laughs> and historically, <coughs> those situations have always made it impossible to renegotiate debt at all because nobody wants to go first. So we are going to have to create or recreate or create new, we can do expand debt forum for all major debtors and creditors, including, all including China. China will obviously want a powerful voice in this. Um, but if you think about the Paris Club, uh, you think of the future, which I believe sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, which I think we need, a global one. Um, uh, China's, that's going to be a very, very big area where concrete cooperation is going to require multilateralism. Uh, trade we've discussed, and I hope that the new Deputy Director General of the WTO um, can put forward ideas on how this system can evolve. It's going to be a very big challenge now, I think, on how to do it. I wish the new Director General, whom I know well, uh, every success. But again, in all these areas, it's partly China comes forward with a 
global view. And the West has to accept China as a legitimate partner. At the moment, I think neither is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, these are completely separate discussions, and that makes it much more difficult to managing things. Now, it's obvious, again, that if you look at the pandemic, um, the WHO is too weak. It needs to be a much stronger in global institution. It lost a lot of legitimacy in early the period in the West, partly because of our mistakes and partly because of theirs. But it should be obvious, we need a much stronger global WHO. And that means every country has to cooperate. It needs far more resources. It needs the ability to coordinate vaccine development, research into disease, just to get rid of some old scourges. We're close to getting rid of malaria. Think of that. Incredible achievement. Um, and we will do that much better together. Uh, but for that to happen, the West and China has to agree on a new program for the WHO, uh, new resources, new governance, uh, which makes it credible to both sides. Uh, and that's not the situation uh, now. So health is a big climate. Um, the, the West is moving towards uh, accelerated carbon reduction. This needs to be accelerated much more. Um, uh, but I think China is going to have to offer to do more, substantially more. It's, it's inevitable, given that it's the world's largest emitter by far, and it emits so much coal. So the, uh, it uses so much coal. So there's going to have to be a round of negotiations in which both sides, both sides give a lot. Otherwise, the planet is going to fry uh, at the moment, we're not going to resolve these problems. So there is a whole range of concrete, specific global challenges in which solutions to, to which solutions will only arrive with very deep cooperation. And uh, at the moment, I'm not going to say who's at fault. It's not really happening. It's not really happening. Um Will it happen? I don't know. It's very difficult. The relations in the US and China at the moment, pretty clearly from the meeting they had up in Alaska, I think it was Alaska, it's pretty bad, but that's the future. That's the, f and both sides are going to have to give. I mean, that's the reality. Both sides are going to have to give, including uh, China. Um, that's where we are. I think it's crucial to understand. And I think it's the one thing on which we completely agree is that where we are now is not very satisfactory. And it's getting worse. And it's getting worse quite quickly. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I, I agree with you. Actually, you partly answered the, the second uh, media outlet, the China Radio International, actually asked about this Belt and Road uh, question you, <laughs> you were uh, giving in that your, uh, this, this, this part of talk, you talk about that. So, so probably we could multilize, you know, Belt and Road and uh, maybe join the Paris uh, Club and uh, make it more transparent. And then let's have a collective uh, interest. So, so I'd, you know, we are lacking a, a big global initiative in the next uh, 30, 40 years or 75 years uh, because we, we, you know, infrastructure, AIB could be upgraded to global <laughs> infrastructure, but then maybe combine that with Belt and Road, multilization going, uh, could be one possible possibility with the, uh, uh, with the WHO improvement and WTO enhancement and all those things. We need to strengthen the global governance system. The, the, there's another question from uh, China Business Network. Uh, talk about, uh, you know, uh, the EU cooperation uh, uh, with Biden. You know, you see uh, there's a EU-US relation. There's a, there's a EU-China relation. China has a CHI, you know, <laughs> a, a, a comprehensive investment uh, treaty uh, EU between China and EU now have, have a little challenge. And uh, ideologically, value-wise, the EU is more... Uh, linger, uh, you know, lean towards, towards U.S., but but economically, all those big European companies are, are having big uh, uh, headway in China. The only company profitable in, in China than their own countries, uh, uh, hugely. I mean, big, 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 big time. And uh, uh, also UK. I mean, China, UK. I mean, uh, uh, the, the 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 Johnson, the Bruce Johnson said, "Go to Britain." I mean, if the uh, break UK is left the EU. If you look beyond EU, maybe you should look far east to China. So 
economically, U.S., China, EU, and U.K., this may be the final question for you. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to go and do something else. Um, I think the way things are evolving at the moment, um, Europe um, has economic relations with both sides, U.S. and and China, and would like to preserve good relations with both. I think it's generally the case. That's point one. Point two, um, ever since the Second World War, Europe's security has been guaranteed by the Americans, and that has not changed. Uh, that has not changed. And uh, relations with uh, security issues have become more important, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, again, that may be right or wrong, but that's how it's perceived. So the, the security relationship is very important. So if the relations between the US and China get worse, Europe will be pulled towards the US. It's just inevitable. How far they will be pulled depends on how relations in the US and China unfold and how potentially damaging the economic evolution will be, uh, which is not clear. So this is uncertain. But I would add finally that while you're absolutely right, Europeans are, um, have a huge interest in China. There is also a lot of stress in European business about their relations with and operations in China on intellectual property issues, on equal treatment issues, um, and indeed whether they will be allowed in the long run really to prosper in China. There's a lot, you just talk to Western businesses, they all have lots of questions about how viable this, not all to the same degree, some are much more successful than others, but a lot of them are really quite anxious about it. So the European business, uh, both US and American businesses are very split now in their, in their view of their relations with China. Some are still wildly enthusiastic and feel there's a tremendous potential and others much less so. And that has shown up in the politics of this. So one of the things I think China has to ask itself is um, are we treating Western businesses in a way that makes them feel they really have a deep stake in the future of China, a productive, profitable uh, stake. And I would say, um, I don't do business, so I'm just reporting, um, that the views of Western businesses on this are very mixed, very mixed. So one of the priorities for China, if it wants to do what you say, is to prevent a Western alliance against it economically, I'm not talking about other economically, um, which at least will be damaging, even though China will surely survive, uh, is to ask, well, are we handling this as well as we possibly could? Are we persuading uh, Western businesses that they have a profitable, safe, secure, protected future, protected as far as intellectual property and so forth is concerned in China? And if not, what can we do about it? Um, now, and I think the answer is it only in part do people feel this confidence. So th there's a geopolitical element, the Western Security Alliance, but there's also an economic element. A number of Western leaders not all, least in Germany, which is the most important, a number of Western leaders think that uh, um, the, uh, uh, the economic relation is not as good as they would like. So that has to be dealt with um, from China's point of view. Of course, there's just as much concern on the Chinese part. I mean, I understand, I've spoken to Huawei, I understand how they feel too. This is very complicated. Uh, but at the moment, where will Europe go? 
if America is led by somebody like Biden, they will, I think, go with the Americans. But of course, Biden's future is quite uncertain. And if it's Trump any, or anybody like Trump, it's completely different. We've got a crisis in the West. Obviously, there's a crisis in the West, and that will obvious to every Chinese person who thinks about it. And obviously, that shapes the options that China will have. But again, let me stress the really big point. China, since it's, I'm addressing a Chinese audience, I would say quite different things. I'm addressing a Western audience, in a Chinese audience. China needs to convince people around the world, particularly in the Western countries, that it is a completely open, fair, equal, reliable partner. And it has done so to a very substantial degree, but in my view, not enough. And this is more important now than it was 20 years ago, because China is so much more important itself than it was. And if people have a defensive attitude to China, the globalization you want to see and I want to see will not happen. China, UK, and uh, you have any words on that? Yeah, the UK, I can't predict the UK. Okay. Um, but everything I said about Europe is even more. The UK has gone sort of crazy from my point of view. Uh, I'm well known to be against Brexit. Uh, but again, uh, I think the view that the UK had in five years ago has changed. Uh, because the divisions between the Western world, the bubble, the US and China have been growing, the US now feels it can't have both equally. That's the problem. People are beginning to feel all over the world. We have to make a choice. Now, some countries are clearly going to choose one way or the other. You know, it's obvious because of, it's overwhelming. For Britain, uh, the simple truth is that our relations with the United States across the whole board, political, strategic, economic, cultural, linguistic, are so close I mean, obviously, so close that if we are really forced to choose by the Americans or the Chinese, most, more likely by the Americans, we will always choose America, even if it makes us poorer. Uh, and, in, and I think, actually, we can't do anything else. We're just, we're, we made a conscious choice in the, not really one we could have made any other, 100 years ago, the end of the First World War, reinforced by the end of the, the Second World War, that Britain was part of the American system and it was our guarantor and our closest ally. And if you look at, think about the history of the two countries, you know, it was a British colony. It's inevitable that that will be the case. So if it really gets to the choice, Britain will go with America. I mean, it's just absolutely obvious. 50 years from now, America goes into total collapse and China is the dominant power in the world in all respects. Well, it could be different, but we're not there that then. So we, we are going to be like Europe, but even more so, particularly because we don't really have a strong base in Europe. And so we are much weaker than we used to be. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Thank you. I, I think that's what I, I can understand. Why this G7 foreign minister held in London now, the UK uh, is playing a very active role on that. Well, I, I think we had a very fascinating discussion, you know, uh, Martin. I mean, uh, uh, thank you for, for taking your precious time. And uh, we, we got over 1 million uh, viewers who have uh, several uh, social media portals and Baidu and, and many others uh, broadcast this live channel, CGTN and everything. So, so it's great. We had this frank discussion and uh, we, we talked about uh, pandemic fighting, the world economic trend and the future development, globalization, where you are so familiar with and also uh, how can we improve the globalization in the future? And of course, then we talk about also uh, the, the the rise, the peaceful rise of China, and how we can peacefully coexist it, and uh, uh, the advantage and disadvantage, and the competitive advantage of each other, and where we can maintain that, and how can we avoid this this trap, and uh, and uh, and also uh, be be really a, a, a partner, even if it's a rivalry partnership. So cooperative rivalry probably is better word. So so I think you know we cover a lot of ground, and finally. Uh, you know, WTO, uh, you know, AIB and uh, WHO and, and China, UK, China, EU. So wide ranging, you know, we're going to digest that and we're going to really, uh, really make a great uh, 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 study of that as well. I mean, our think time, we, we're really going to sort of all those, uh, all those ideas and, 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 
uh, we're going to very well document that. So thank you so much for taking your time. And uh, I hope next time when you, <laughs> we invite you to come to Beijing and then speak at the CCG and uh, uh, appreciate your time. So, so your final uh, <laughs> word to, to our audience before we close, yes. Well, as you said, this has been a long and very deep discussion. Um, I think fairly frank. And uh, uh, I've enjoyed it enormously. I believe in globalization and I believe in the management of our shared planet. Uh, it's our destiny and our duty to, to manage this planet in such a way that we transmit it to future generations in a good state. And it has many huge challenges. Uh, the relations between China and the West will play an enormous part in determining how uh, how this plays out over the next decades and indeed possibly centuries. Um, I'm a Westerner. I have very strong uh, attachment to core Western values, uh, and that's inevitable and I think right, but I think I do so without any illusions about uh, what the West has done, Western history, its f faults and crimes. Um, but I am a Westerner, uh, and I don't want to give up on our core values, individual liberty, the law and democracy. Um, but the great threat to that is internal, not from anyone else. Uh, but those frictions of power and, I and ideas between the West and China will continue. I think that's absolutely clear. But I also think they're manageable because what we share, that's the key point, is more important than what divides us. What do we share? We're all human. We all want to lead better lives. We all want peace, I think. Uh, and we want our children and grandchildren, in my case, I have lots of grandchildren, to, to live uh, fulfilled lives into the next century. And that will demand close, intelligent cooperation um, between us. Um, and that will make really big demands on both sides, on both China and the West. We're going to have to do things differently by taking into account the views and interests of each other in a way that is very unnatural for, for great powers. But it is a particular great powers which are divided in so many ways by history and culture. But I think it's possible. Indeed, not only is it possible, it is absolutely essential. The alternative is truly is catastrophe. If we end up in a fundamentally errat ineradicably conflictual relationship, we will not be able to manage the world. And at worst, we will destroy it. So what is at stake here is all our futures our futures of everybody we care about. Great, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. You said something very profound there. We are, we are all human beings. We are, we are all living in the same planet. We, we are all global villagers. We need to look for a, a better future and also manage our differences and coexist peacefully and strive for the better future. Thank you so much for, for taking time talking to us. Thank you very much, Martin. Yeah. Appreciate great it. Great pleasure. Thank you.